In this video, I am going to use the worksheet I gave you guys in class and go over how to solve the different types of problems, not necessarily go through the answers, but how to apply Newton's laws of motions and our circular motion concepts to the problems in the packet. So in question number one, we have a light string connected to two unknown masses, M1 and M2, passing through a cylindrical tube. A student holds the tube and swings the apparatus so that M1 goes in a horizontal circle of radius R while M2 hangs straight down. The student wants to use this apparatus to experimentally determine the acceleration due to gravity. There is no friction between the string and the tube and M2 is larger than M1. So in an experiment like this, M1 is the thing that's gonna be traveling in a circle. So that means on M1, there must be some net centripetal force. And M2 is actually going to be at rest. While it might bob up and down, we're not gonna consider it accelerating in any direction. So as with most problems, we wanna start with a free body diagram. So M1 has a tension acting on it and a force of gravity, and M2 has a tension acting on it and a force of gravity. Okay. Now, just like we did with Atwood's machines, the two tensions, because it is the same string, are going to be equal, and that's gonna be helpful for us. So let's take a look at net force equations for M1 and M2. In M1, or for M1, the only interesting direction really is that circular direction. So we're gonna look at what might be causing M1 to move in a circle. So we're gonna take a look at this centripetal force equation. Okay, so for M1, it looks like it's the tension causing M1 to move in a circle, so that means the tension is the centripetal force. And we can set that equal to MAC. And remember, AC is the same thing as V squared over R. So we can write that as that. And just an aside, this is moving at a constant velocity. So if we needed to, we could substitute in V as 2 pi R over T, where T is the period, R is the radius. Okay, so now for mass two, we have only forces acting in the Y direction. And because M2 is at rest, M2 has a net force of zero. So that means the tension minus Fg2 is gonna equal zero. So that tells us the tension has to equal Fg2 or M2g. So really, even though it's the tension causing M1 to move in a circle, that tension comes from the weight of the hanging block. So if we change the weight of that hanging block, we're gonna be able to change the tension, which will change how the mass one moves in a circle. Okay, now in this question, we're looking for g, okay? but we don't really have information about the speed, okay? so we couldn't necessarily use mv squared over r to help us find the tension to help us find g. Okay? But what we could measure is the radius and the period. Okay? We could experimentally measure those. The radius, you just use a meter stick. Period, you just use a stopwatch. So this equation for tension really becomes m, 2 pi r over t, and everything in that parenthesis is squared over r. So when we distribute that, we get 4 pi squared r squared over t squared, and there's an r downstairs. Okay. One of the r's cancels, so we're left with 4 pi squared m r over t, and I forgot my squared here. Okay. So it looks like there's a direct relationship between the tension and the radius, the tension and the mass one, and the tension and the period have an inverse relationship. So we could then set this equation for tension here equal to m2g down here to help us find g. So we could have m2g is four pi squared m1r, over t squared. We just divide both sides by m2, and we see that g could be calculated by finding or using different masses and experimentally finding r and the period, or t. So that's it for the first one, and that'll help you get through the rest of the problems.
Okay, so let's take a look at the second one in this packet. So the second one in this packet, we have a ball swinging horizontally, okay? but it is swinging horizontally because of some tension at an angle. And if you look, it makes an angle with vertical. Okay? We're also moving at a constant speed in that circle, which is nice. So the force is acting on the ball. Well, we have a tension force provided by the string and naturally the force of gravity. Okay? Now the tension's acting at an angle, so that tension will need to be broken up into components okay, where we have a Ty that opposes Fg and a Tx. Now it's a little bit clearer that it's really the x component of the tension that's responsible for moving us in a circle. Okay? So if I wanted to look at net force equations for this question, I would look at the y direction, which is kind of boring because it's not bobbing up or down in the y direction, so that equals zero. So we have Ty minus Fg equals zero. Now normally our y components are sine, but because we have the angle with vertical, the y component in this question is actually the cosine. So that's something to keep in mind. Okay, so we have T cosine theta equals mg. And depending upon what variables we can use in our answer, that may or may not work as a way to find tension. Okay. In the circular direction or centripetal direction, like I talked about earlier, it's really the tension in the x direction that's causing the centripetal force. So that tension in the x direction, because we have the angle with vertical, is going to end up being T sine theta. And remember, we don't necessarily know the acceleration, but we do know that this object is moving with a constant velocity V0 over R. So we could also use that equation to find tension. Okay? Obviously, this tension and this tension are the same because the cosine and sine just give us the components. Okay? So we could use different parts of that equation to help us solve the rest of the questions there. All right, so now we have a ball that is swinging in a vertical circle. So it's attached to a string of length L. So that's our radius. If you ever have a string moving in a circle and the string is length L, that L represents your radius. Swinging counterclockwise in a vertical circle. So going like that. At the bottom of the circle, the tension in the strings is four times the weight. So that means down here at A, the tension at A is 4 mg. <clears throat> so let's draw free body diagrams for all of the locations A, B, and C, and we'll do some net force analysis on those as well. Okay, so for A, right, acting on the ball at A, which is when we're at the bottom of the circle, okay, we have a tension force that's going to point in. Think about it if I drew it right here, right? Tension is going to point up or into the circle and a force of gravity pointing down. Now, both of those forces actually contribute to the centripetal force. Since the tension points into the circle, the tension's positive, and since mg points out of the circle, mg is negative. Okay. And we already know that the tension at A, according to the problem, is for mg. So we could Simplify this and see that the centripetal force or net force is 3 mg. Okay. Of course, the m's can cancel, so we can actually see that our centripetal acceleration is three times the acceleration due to gravity. So if you've ever heard of something referred to in terms of g's, this would be 3 g's. So you'd be feeling an acceleration three times that of gravity. Okay. All right. So at B, we're kind of at the side of the circle. Tension points into the circle. And Mg points down. Okay? So tension is the only force that's going to cause a centripetal force at this location. Now the tension at B is not going to be the same as the tension at A. Okay? because this ball is not moving at a constant speed around the circle. This ball is going to slow down 
as it moves from A to B to C, okay, because of this downward force of gravity. Then from C back to A, this ball is going to speed back up. Okay, so that'll give you some hint as far as ranking the tensions T A, T B, T C. Okay. So at C, we're at the top of the circle. We have a tension pointing downward and MG pointing downward. Okay, so since they are both pointing either into or out of the circle, both of those forces contribute to the centripetal force. They're both pointing into the circle, so they're both positive. So this is TC. Okay. Remember, at any of these locations, you could use the equation A equals V squared over R to help you find the speed of the object at that location. Just keep in mind that R for this problem is the variable L. Right. So now we have question number four. So we have a penny of mass M sitting on a turntable as shown. A student turns the turntable on, which turns a knob that controls how fast the surface turntable moves. So you hopefully know that record table or record players can change how fast they're going depending upon what you need. So the student notices that at some speeds the penny doesn't slide. She wants to find the maximum coefficient of static friction between the penny and the surface. So as long as this penny is not sliding, we're going to be dealing with a static force of friction, okay? Because it's not sliding relative to the surface. And this is true of cars going around turns as well. You wouldn't really think of it this way, but it's actually friction that's causing you to go in the circle because your car or this penny its inertia wants to fly outwards, but friction keeps pulling us in towards the circle. Okay. So the free body diagram for this penny would look like a force of static friction pointing in towards the circle, and our standard normal force, and force of gravity in the y direction. So again, we'll look at net force equations for this question. We'll look at the y direction first, since that's a little bit more familiar. We're going to equal zero because the penny is not jumping off the turntable or crashing through it. So we have a normal force minus Fg equals zero. And like we've seen many times before, the normal force is equal to Fg. Remember, that's not an always thing. It just happens a lot. Now, like I said, the centripetal force is caused by the static force of friction. Okay. Now, this static force of friction, if you remember, is variable up to some maximum okay so as we change the centripetal acceleration or really the velocity okay, the amount of static friction applied to the penny is going to change up until we reach some maximum point when the penny actually breaks free of the surface and flies off okay so this force of static friction we can set equal to mu s Specifically in the question, we were asking about mu, um, mu s maximum, so this mu x max would be multiplied by the normal force, and we could find the maximum speed that we could travel at to still be on the surface. The normal force is equal to mg, okay. so we have mu s max, mg equals mv squared max over r, the masses end up canceling, okay, and we want to solve for V max. Okay. So I sometimes refer to this as the rug equation because it does kind of look like we've spelled the, the speed rug or the word rug. Okay. And this equation is also going to work for cars going around turns. So if you know the coefficient of friction, coefficient of static friction between the tires and the road, you can calculate how fast you can essentially take the turn, which is how they determine the speed limits on off-ramps and on-ramps on different highways. And that is it for these questions. Okay, and those are the kind of basic circular motion problems. They're not really basic. They're the more complicated circular motion problems you might come across.